This is either incredibly smart or incredibly stupid. And either way, we'll find out in a minute. Just in case. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. Are you tired of trying to remember all of your username and password combinations? Have you run out of room on your monitor for more sticky notes? NordPass's user-friendly desktop and mobile applications allow you to easily access all of your passwords on any device from wherever you are. And with their zero-knowledge architecture, your data is encrypted on your own device before it ever reaches their servers. Visit nordpass.com slash craft today to download it for free and take the hassle out of password management. That's nordpass.com slash craft. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. This is certainly one of the more unique collections of parts I've ever started a video out with. I'm going to be modding this Xbox One X to house a small gaming PC inside of it to function as an emulation and light gaming PC here in my office. But for that project, I needed a video card that would fit inside of it. For that purpose, I decided to go with this little card right here. Now, believe it or not, despite its size, this is a full GTX 1650. This is a card sold via OEM channels through Dell, and I managed to pick this up for just $150. But don't get too excited if you're looking for a lightweight graphics card today, as this one is completely sold out as well. The only reason I was able to snag one of these for that price is I bought this all the way back in November before even the inexpensive graphics cards had completely sold out everywhere. Now, while this is a fairly small graphics card with a very basic aluminum heatsink on it, it's still just a little bit too tall to fit inside my planned case mod in the Xbox One S. So today, we're going to fix that. Now, the GTX 1650 is only a 75 watt TDP card, so that means it is actually fairly easy to keep cool. See the just standard aluminum block and 80 millimeter fan they stuck on top of this. But I do need something that was a lot thinner, but could still hold up to somewhere around 75 watts. So I came up with this, and this is the NVIDIA Quadro K2000. As you can see, this is a true single slot form factor GPU, which means the cooler should work perfectly for me. And the reason I ended up picking the K2000 is the bolt pattern on the rear is the exact same as the 1650. So awesome, take the heatsink off of the K2000, bolt it onto the 1650 and we should be good to go, right? Well, no, and that's what the drill bits are for. You see, on the back of the K2000, there are no additional components on the PCB sticking up. It's just the die itself making contact with the heatsink and everything else sits below it. However, on the GTX 1650, you can see that we've actually got a couple capacitors to deal with. So that might be a problem in getting this heatsink to fit. And if you haven't caught up to me at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and spell it out for you. Uh, I'm gonna take the K2000 cooler off of this and we're gonna drill holes to be able to mount around the capacitors on the 1650. Yeah. <laughs> I do know the GTX 1650 does work, as I was able to plug it into a machine and run it through a couple of tests. However, I'm not going to do a before and after temperature test, and the reason being is all I care about is that this is adequate to cool it. I don't care that it performs any better or worse than the aluminum heat sink that's on here. And I really shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to anyway. Number one, don't drink and use power tools. You'll notice there's not a beer on my table right now. Number two, don't try this at home. This is my own stupid idea and my own money. Uh, I'm not responsible if you break your own components. With that said, let's uh, go ahead and get started. First off, let's go ahead and take apart the K2000 and see what we're dealing with. Now, on the rear of this, there are only five screws to remove. There's one holding the PCB into the heatsink, and then there's the four screws right here that hold the heatsink onto the die. And it just lifts right off. Next up, we're gonna turn the heatsink around, and then there are six Torx bits that are around that hold the shroud onto the heatsink. And that just lifts right off. Last thing to do is to remove the fan right here, and that's done by unscrewing these two Phillips heads on the back. Leaving us with just a heatsink. Now, I'm already seeing one minor difficulty in completing this project. Uh, you see this uh, smoothed out region in the heatsink right here that kind of looks heat pipe shaped? Uh, there's a heat pipe inside of this that I was not aware of. You can actually see the copper sticking out right there. Uh, I'm gonna have to be really careful when drilling, number one. Number two, I hope no components get in the way 
of that because that's going to be really close to where the capacitors are that I have to drill out space for. Let's hope they're further back than where the heatsink goes. And of course to do that there's only one way to find out and that's by taking apart the 1650. For the 1650 there's only four screws on the rear and again they are spring loaded. Leaving us with the 1650 heatsink and as you can see it's nothing special. It's just a block of aluminum with fins cut in. There's not even a copper pad. Uh, apparently they've been taking notes from Intel. Alright, let's have a quick look here. Wow, that's going to be close. So the capacitor lands right about there, and the other component lands just off to the side right here. So I think we got lucky, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, mount up this heatsink with some longer screws so I can get an exact location that I'm going to have to drill. All right, battle one is a success. As you can see, the whole pattern is exactly the same. Now let's see about marking the location of that capacitor. So there's the best view I can get. As you can see, it looks like we're gonna just miss that heat pipe, uh, but it's going to be awfully close. So uh, hopefully I don't get too close to it. All right, so that is where I need to drill, and here's where the other component is interfering with the heat sink, so that little chunk has to go as well. And as you can see, it looks like I'm just barely gonna miss that heat pipe. Um, as long as I drill this accurately, I should be just fine. So, let's fire up the drill press and uh, have some fun. through and it doesn't look like I hit the heat pipe although I came very very close to it. Uh, there's a little bit of copper peaking out there but it is not breached. Now I did run into one additional problem and that is that I still need a little bit more clearance up here by the uh, front capacitors. It's not much but that heat pipe does run right to the edge right there. So I need to trim away maybe about a sixteenth of an inch or so to give enough clearance and I think that's all the room that I have uh, before I hit that heat pipe. So uh, we're gonna give this another go and we'll see if we can get this thing to mount flush. You know what, since there's so little that I need to take off, I think I'm gonna use some hand tools for this one. All right, our heat sink is looking pretty good at this point, if I can get it in focus. You can see I've managed to take a couple of notches out of there. You can see the copper heat pipe shining through there, but I did not rupture it. So, so far, so good on the modification for the heat sink. So the heat sink is going pretty well, but unfortunately I ran into one problem with the graphics card and the layout of it, and that is this little guy right here. Uh, this is a crystal oscillator, and it lays directly underneath the heat pipe, so I'm not going to be able to shave back the heat sink in order to fit around that. Remember at the beginning of the video when I said don't try this at home? Uh, this goes doubly for this part. I'm going to unsolder the crystal oscillator and flip it to the back of the PCB. It should still run just fine as it is a full pass through component and give me the little bit of extra space that I need to get the heat sink to mount up to the die. So let's give that a shot. Just like that. And just like that, the crystal oscillator has moved from the front of the board to the rear of the board. And hopefully that will give us enough room to mount our heat sink. So, moment of truth time. This should, if it's facing the right way, slot right over the top of everything and mount right up. 
Before I put everything back together, I do want to point out just how tight the capacitor is to that heat pipe that's down in there. Do you see that little bit of copper poking through? I had to take a screwdriver and basically bend that into a small arc so I could get the capacitor to clear. Uh, it does clear. It is about as tight as I could possibly make it, especially when you consider I had to do the same thing on the front of the heat sink here. Yeah, the heat pipe is basically touching the capacitors on both sides, but I think I have just enough clearance for this to actually work. And that is one mounted heatsink to a GTX 1650. So at least in theory, we have a single slot GTX 1650 now. Uh, we'll see how the cooling performance is, but there is one more thing that I need to figure out and that's the fan. So in theory, this is just a standard four pin PWM fan with blue, green, yellow, and black wires. However, the plug is a little bit different. Now I have two problems. Number one, it doesn't reach the header over here. Number two, the header on the GTX 1650 is only a two pin voltage controlled fan. To fix that, I'm gonna hook it up to a four pin PWM fan extension cable. This will plug into the motherboard and then the motherboard can regulate the fan speed on the GTX 1650. So for right now, something that looks like that. And uh, if this ends up being a permanent solution, I'll go ahead and take the time and solder in a new cable. But uh, for now, we can just hook this up to the motherboard and hopefully, we have a working single slot GTX 1650. All right, are you guys as excited as I am to give this a shot? Or as nervous as I am? Because frankly, I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I haven't tested this in the interim between, you know, testing it when I first got it and then putting it in a box and then moving components on the board and adding a whole new heat sink to it. Um, from what I can see, it does have very good contact with the die. So I don't think I'm worried about that. What I am worried about is, is my solder job on the crystal oscillator good enough? And there's also that capacitor near the back of the board that I cut out the hole in the heatsink for. Um, apparently I didn't have quite enough room even with notching the front of the heatsink because it's pitched off at a pretty good angle. And I can see the bottom of it has lifted off the board slightly. Now the pin itself is not broken and it's still going through the board. But that may present me an issue. Uh, I don't know, and we're about to find out. First off, let's find out if my fan is actually properly wired for PWM, because that would be a deal breaker right there. Plug that in. All right, our fan is spinning, and it sounds like it is controlled by the motherboard, so I think I have the proper PWM header hooked up. Trust me, you'd know if this was just sending at 12 volt because uh, it'd be trying to take off in my hand here. Actually, that's quite a bit of air coming through. That should be able to keep this card nice and cool. All right, let's, uh, let's plug it in for real. And in three, two, one. Okay, it didn't immediately shut down. So at least the voltage is getting through just fine. We'll see if we get a post though. We got a post. At least I have a keyboard. I don't see any video yet. I've got a keyboard and no video. The VGA light is on on the motherboard. This is not filling me with confidence. Well, I told you I might need it. Let's go ahead and take this thing apart and uh, see if we can find out why it's not working. I think I know why it's not working. So you see this uh, capacitor there that's standing at like two o'clock? I think that's why. I don't think I actually had enough room 
even with as much as I added into that hole right there with uh, smoothing out that heat pipe. I think it was just a little bit too much. What I will say is I had fantastic contact on the die. So I think possibly if I replace this capacitor, we might be in business, maybe. But either way, I don't think this video is ending with a happy note. I might have failed today, but who amongst us has not thought about trying to do something like this? I have successfully done GPU heatsink transplants before, but probably not one quite this ambitious. Um, I mean, I've done water cooling before. I've done a couple of, uh, of Aereo, you know, the, the third party coolers. I've never tried to take a stock cooler and put it onto a different card that it wasn't meant for. And I will say, I think I came really close. From what I can tell, nothing is actually shorting out or grounding out when I put this heatsink on. I think I have plenty of clearance from all the components. I did double check all that. I am getting good die contact. Um, I think the problem is either that capacitor is being bent a little bit too much, uh, or the crystal oscillator that I relocated, I either damaged in the process or possibly just didn't get a good solder job on. But from what I can tell, the solder is, is bang on. My bet is on the capacitor. Now, unfortunately, I don't have that capacitor on hand. Uh, there is an electronic shop fairly near to me. I think tomorrow I'm gonna end up going there, seeing if they have the proper capacitor and see if I can uh, dial this thing in. So, unfortunately, I think this is where I'm going to leave you, with a dead GPU, because even though I get good contact on the die, it doesn't do a whole lot of good if the GPU won't turn on. If you like this video and all of my other stupid ideas, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are both down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and all of the other hosts from Talking Heads. My once weekly live show for the latest in beer and tech news every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific time, right here on YouTube or in podcast form on Anchor.fm. Thank you all so much for watching this one. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Before we find out if I'm an idiot or not, which quite honestly could go either way, uh, today's beer is from, I think that's Fiatland Bre Brewing Company, uh, Extra Special ESB. Uh, so it's an English pale or an English standard bitters or a, there's a whole bunch of definitions for ESB. Um, I've already had a little bit of this while I was polishing this thing up. Um, it's very hoppy. It's, it's a surprisingly hoppy beer for an ESB. Rather than ESB, this tastes a lot more like a brown ale to me, um, which I guess is very similar to, uh, to an English ale or something like that. It's hoppy, but it's not awe-inspiring. It's, it's malty, but it's not super sweet or super one way or the other. It's just kind of right there in the middle. It's, it's acceptable. If anyone poured me this, I'd be more than happy to drink it. I'm not gonna go out and seek this again because it's not like, oh, I have to have that one. But it's not a bad thing to have in your fridge. <laughs>